Thank you. It's truly an honor to be here this morning. I always enjoy coming to EBC and uh, getting to know your, your pastors, uh, Lynn and, and Brock. And I knew Brock was a good singer, and I was like, wow, he is really crushing it this morning. And then his sound went off, and I were like, oh, that woman. <laughs> But he's still, I still think he's a good singer. <laughs> yeah, wow, I, I just love going to church on Sunday mornings. It's just a, for me, it's it's a beautiful way to reset. You know, I spend a lot of time, you know, throughout the week working and thinking about, you know, just life and stuff, you know, are you with me? And then you come to church on Sunday morning and just be reminded of like all of this things and stuff that we work so hard at, it's temporary. I mean, it's, it's, it's way bigger. Than, than this life. It's, it's much more to come. And so I've come to church just reminds me of that singing and worshiping and as we continue to worship, um, just be reminded of, of the fact that, you know, life is short and there's much more to come after this life. And let, let's, let's, you know, get focused in, on Jesus and what's important. Um, some of you came this morning just to be reminded that, you know, what, what you're experiencing right now is temporary. It's, it's, it's going to change, good or bad. Like, it's, life is like that. It's, it's seasons. And the other day, I was walking. Uh, I take a walk every morning. I was walking down the road, and I found some leaves that were red. I should have brought a couple of them along. I saw some this morning. I just didn't pick any up. There were some red ones and some yellow ones. Now, I know it's not fall yet. Uh, just a couple of, couple of early uh, drops from the sycamore trees or sassafras trees and the poplar trees. Uh, a lot of yellow ones dropping these days. But it just reminded me, like, you know, fall's coming. Like, it's still summer, and I don't mean, I don't mean to rain on anybody's parade here. You know, like, I love summer and enjoy it. But, like, in a few weeks, it's going to start getting a little cooler than it was this morning even. You know, it's, it's beautiful to be past the, past the storm and all the rain. But, you know, eventually it's going to get cold again. You know, just a reminder to us all that, that God is good in all these seasons. God is good. This morning, I'd like to talk about... Uh, the same theme, kind of like the same theme, but a little different emphasis that we were discussing in Sunday school this morning. I told, uh, I told uh, Daniel, is it right? Uh, that I was teaching our class this morning. I said that was a great primer for our for our sermon this morning. And uh, I'm not sure what what discussion you ladies might have had in your class, but in the men's class we had a really really interesting conversation. But this morning, um, I've entitled my sermon uh, "The Work Shift." And the reason I called it that was because at Shiloh, and this has kind of just been my thinking uh, recently, at Shiloh, we're, we're kind of on a journey right now of, of shifting our, our, our minds or our paradigm, the way, the way we think about what church is. And so we're trying to learn to uh, think about church as being something we are rather than a place we go to. You know, normally you say, you know, you go to church. We came to church this morning, right? But we're trying to shift the way we think about that to, like, church is you and me as we leave this building this morning and we go to work tomorrow. And so this morning I'd like to talk about um, what that means to be the church when we go to work. And it sounds a little weird, doesn't it? You know, like, usually you, you meet people at work and you, you want them to come to your church, right? You invite them somebody that needs to know the Lord or that was looking for a place to go to fellowship, you say, well, I think you should come to my church, right? Well, how about if we started thinking about, I am the church. Like, I'm going to go to church at work on Monday morning. <coughs> just, a, just a food for thought for you there. But that's, that's kind of the direction I'd like to uh, think about this morning. You know, God has given us all, I have a job, you have a job. We've all got work to do. You know, we all got to make a living, and a few years ago, I used to tell my wife, you know, I just was really tired of my job. I, I, I really just, I could find something else to do, you know, it just wasn't challenging anymore. I've been doing it for over 30 years, and, I, you know, she said, look, you know, like, we all got to work, right? like, we all got to have a job to do. So, and she's right, um, and, and I did, actually, uh, two years ago, I found a, a change of vocation, so that was, that was a real shift for my, uh, my, my job, but, um, we all have a job to do, and you know, we all say, I, I, I think I'm safe in saying that, if, if somebody were to say, what's the purpose of, of our life? Like, what, why do we, maybe I should ask the question, 
Let me have a little bit of response. If, if I ask the question, what is the purpose of your life? Like, why do you, why did God give you a life? Or what, what, what is the ultimate purpose of living? What, what would it be for? What would you say it would be? What's your life for? To talk about him. To talk about him. A lot of times we say to bring God glory, right? Yep. It's been said that the glory of God is man fully alive. In other words, God gets the most glory than when you and I become fully alive. So what does it mean to come alive? What does it mean to really live? I like to talk about uh, three things this morning. I like to talk about workmanship, work, and walk. The three W's of working, maybe I could say it like that. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And in our Sunday school class, we, we even read these a couple of verses from this, uh, from this chapter. And I like to focus on um, the verses 1 through 10, and mainly want to zero in on verse 10. Verse 10 talks about, um, about work and workmanship. In our Sunday school class, I'm not sure what you ladies talked about, but in our Sunday school class, in the men's class, we talked about what it means to sin, or what sin is. Or when Paul said, or when John said in 1 John 3.15 in our Sunday school lesson, he said, uh, in verse, verse 5, he said, in him is no sin. And uh, I think in verse... Uh, Verse 9, I believe it was. Um, <clears throat> the one who is born of God will continue to sin. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. So we were talking about, like, what does it mean to be, to, to, have, to have sin or to sin or to be forgiven of sin? And I thought I'd kind of start out by just kind of zeroing in on that idea. And what it is that as believers we've been forgiven from. I think sometimes in in uh, Christianity in general we get confused about what what it is that we've been saved from. As believers, as followers of Jesus, we've been forgiven of our sinful nature. Like we've all been born in sin, right? Adam and Eve took that fruit, and ever since that. We've been sinful. So it's that sinful nature that God forgives us for. Now, true God forgives us for sinful deeds we do. But deeper than that, we're forgiven for the very nature that we were born with. And if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, hopefully we can talk, you can think more about it as we go along here. But when you think about the fact that you've been forgiven for the very nature of your humanity. And then you begin to live from that forgiven nature. We still live in the same bodies. We don't get a brain transformation. We don't get a brain transplant. The things that we've done in the past are still there, but they've been forgiven. And when we can learn to live from that, we can begin to come alive. So let's, let's read Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to think about the whole idea of being forgiven from our sinful nature as we read this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to read this in the ESV. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in, passage, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires, sorry, sorry, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So much to talk about here, but I only have about a half an hour to do it, so I'll try to, to do it. I'll try to pick out a couple of highlights. But one of the things that really stood out to me as I studied this uh, just recently is the, is the fact that my salvation is way more an act of God than a decision of mine. Now, you might say, wait, what did you say? I, <laughs> I'm not trying to say that, you, you, that I didn't have a choice in the matter, so don't just hear me out here. So this says that God being rich in mercy, because of his great love, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. What does it mean to be dead? Like there's no life, right? So if there's a corpse and it comes to life, how how much how much energy from that corpse could make that corpse come alive in itself? Like, when something is dead, there's no life in it. Another way to think about it is, if you were laying in the bottom of the ocean, dead, like, that would be pretty much dead, I believe, right? If you're in the bottom of the ocean, how much ability would you have to come up and reach for a rescue rope? If you were dead. You follow my thinking? You're absolutely not. So God wakes us up. And then it says. He, he brings us. Um, we're dead in trespasses. He makes us come alive. With Christ. And then he raises us up. And I think this is where our choice begins. So we're dead. And God says, I want to wake this guy up. He brings him to life. And he raises us up. And all of a sudden, now we're aware that we're awake. Okay? So what are we going to do with it? And a lot of mankind realizes they're awake. But they reject the opportunity to walk with God or to receive the seating with Christ that he offers. It says, he wakes us up, or he rises us up, or he makes us come alive. And then he raises us up, and then he seats us with Christ in heavenly places. I think this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, if you live, if you, if you believe in me, and you follow my commandments, and you walk with me, my Father and I will come and I'll make our home in you, and we will live in you. Just like uh, Lynn said, we have Christ living within us. And when we realize what God did to raise us up, to make us come alive, and then we had the opportunity to know the truth, and to be able to receive that forgiveness, and receive that life, I don't know what that does for you, but it makes me feel so indebted to Christ that I don't have any other choice because of the gratitude in my heart for what I've received. I have to live for him. And so, while I still have my humanity, my heart is sold out to follow Jesus. And so, because I have my humanity, and I, and I still, you know, have weaknesses, and I still have failures, and I still have things i got to work through, the grace of God is, is what he's talking about. Verse 8, in this passage we just read, it's by grace we have been saved through faith. And when I realize that and I rely on that, like, my focus is on following Jesus. It's not on preventing my, it's, it's not in trying not to get to hell. 
It's in trying to know Jesus and spend time with Jesus and walk with Jesus. You see what I'm saying? There's a shift in our focus. So what Paul, the reason Paul wrote this book of Ephesians was because there was people that came to the church at Ephesus from all different walks of life. Just like you hear at EBC. Yep, we have people from all different, uh, different backgrounds and different walks of life and come from different places in the world. And that's how it was in Ephesus. And Paul was writing this to remind people that no matter where we come from, no matter what we come from, no matter what past history we have, we all come to God's grace and to the knowledge of him because of God, not because of ourselves. And when we realize that, we are no, I should say it like this, when I realize that, that that's how it is, there's no way that I can think of myself any better than anyone else. There's no way that you can think of anybody else lower or higher than yourself. You follow my thinking? It's, it's, it's God's grace that's bestowed on us that give, make, makes this all possible. To me, when I, when, when I like first understood that or realized that, it just... It just like opened up my heart. And instead of trying not to do the wrong thing, but now I'm I'm pursuing Jesus. And I still do wrong things. But my pursuit and the path that I'm walking is to is to find him. Coming to verse 10, I'd like to, to focus the rest of the time on, on verse 10 and talk about what it means to be uh, to what it means to be the church and to take that understanding of God's grace and the life that Jesus has given me and take it to the place that I work and the people I do business with and the people I go to school with. He starts out in verse 10 by saying, and it's, what's interesting to me is he goes through this whole thing about everything about your salvation and everything about you being a new person in Christ is, is something that God does for us. And then, then he says, um, it's not by any works because it's not by, verse, the end of verse 10 says, this is not by your own doing. I think in the King James Version it says, it's not by works that, that, you, that you do. And then verse 10 he says, it's, we are his workmanship created for good works. So he comes right back to the word works. You see? Because we all have to work. This past week we were at um, we we're at a, a global leadership, it's called the Global Leadership Center over here at LCBC and it's a two day uh, leadership training conference. <coughs> Excuse me, there was a professor from the Harvard School, uh, I think it was the Harvard School of Business, I think I had the right college in mind, like the top shelf uh, business college in the country. And this guy was a professor at that school and he taught a class of all the things in business school. He taught a class on happiness. <laughs> he said he has 128 students and 200 students on his waiting list for this class of happiness at the business school of all places. And I thought that was really fascinating. The guy's a, a believer, but at the end of his at the end of his lecture, he said there's four things that we need to have balanced in order to find happiness. And they're all supported by scripture. Like he could, he could have made a sermon out of it from the Bible. But he, his <laughs> was so fascinating to me is this was a sermon. This was like a uh, a talk on happiness from a, from a sort of secular perspective, and it was based on statistics and studies that universities have done. I mean, like this was this was extensive studies on what brings people happiness, and and he said. That we have to have these four things in order in order to be happy. We have to have uh, we have to have faith. We have to have family, friends. And what do you think the fourth one was? Work. I thought that was very interesting. You know, like we need to be working. We need to do things with our hands in order to find fulfillment. That's how God made it. When God made Adam and He put him in the garden, what's the instructions God gave to Adam? What's the first instructions God gave to him? Remember what he said? Yeah, yeah, he said, take care of the garden. You know, do things. Till the land or whatever, but he didn't sweat. 
that was that's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, we 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 need to um, we need to understand that the life we have and the work we do is is so that we can demonstrate or be a demonstration of God's workmanship. Verse ten says, "For for you are created in Christ." I'm sorry. For we are His workmanship. Back in uh, back in nineteen. Back in 19, back in the 1900s, back in 1970, I'm going to guess four or something like that, when I was about 10 or 12 years old, uh, I, I, did, I did some workmanship. I built about, I built about, uh, I think it was about 15 plastic models. How many here have built a plastic model? Truck or car, something, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I built about 15 uh, different cars and trucks. I had a 63 Corvette. I had a 70, <clears throat> 70 uh, Chevy Blazer. I had uh, I had a Mustang. I, I had uh, all kinds. Of, I had a I had a semi uh, Peterbilt with a with a bunk on and a and a trailer. And uh, I had two of these old trucks. It looks like uh, my axle fell off, and I tried to re re-glue it but it didn't stay but anyway this is a uh, this is a, this is uh, one of my one of my uh, demonstrations of my workmanship now if you look at it very closely it's not a very good workmanship I, I look at that thing and say like why didn't they take the time to do it right you know like, uh, but if, if you see on the side there it says Roy W. Zimmerman if you're from Africa, you might might recognize that name. That's a fuel oil delivery service that my father my father drove a fuel oil delivery truck for Roy Zimmerman back in the uh, back in the 70s, and I used to ride with him every once in a while. So when I built this little model here, I, I wrote the, wrote that on there, and um, so that that's uh, that's something I built with my hands out of a plastic model kit. So that's a demonstration. Of, uh, of my workmanship, which is a lot to be desired. Um, with God's workmanship, it's very different. You and I are a demonstration of God's workmanship <coughs> when our lives are transformed by His grace. And so when we can take the life that we have and we take it to work with us, we can be a demonstration of who God is and what and, and how God acts and treats people. The second thing he says in that verse is, we are, we're his workmanship and we are created for good works. Now, I don't know about you, but when I used to read this verse, I used to think about good works as being something like, um, you know, you, you help out at, at a shelter or you help out at a soup kitchen or... You know, you you help uh, an older person. One time, I was I was I was driving down the road in the winter time, and I came to this red light, and there was this there was this elderly lady <clears throat> shoveling snow. She was really bent over, and she was shoveling real slow, and I I just I, I felt bad. I mean, wow, you know, like she had, she had to nobody was there to do it for, her, so I I pulled over and I asked if I could help, and she she let me do it. You know, like I, that's that's good works, right? Like helping somebody out that's that's uh, in need. But I would like to think about good works here, and he goes on to say that that um, that he's prepared for us beforehand. Good works that he he's talking about here, I believe, are the jobs that we have. They're the things that we do with our hands to make a living. Have you ever thought about the job that you do as being something other than you know just the way to make a living? <laughs> we all have to have a job. We all have to make a living. What if we, what if we did that that mind shift of the same same way as taking church to work, as, as shifting the way we think about our jobs as being our calling, the things that we, uh, the things that we do with our hands, um, and the way we do it's probably more the way we do the things with our hands is what brings glory to God, and is what makes us makes us come alive. You know, when you ask somebody, you meet a stranger and, and you know, you get acquainted and you ask them their name, you know, what's usually the next question you ask? Like, so what do you do, right? 
So we, we often think about what we do or our jobs or what we do for a living as being our identity, right? So, you know, I ask, ask Brother Lynn what he does, he's a realtor, right? So, so he's, you call him a realtor, right? So that's his identity. But that's only the work that he's been given to do because of the way God created him. His identity and our identity needs to be in who God says we are, not what we do with our hands. Now what happens is we find out something that God has really made us to do. We enjoy doing that. We get really good at it. And we should, and that's how it should work. And then all of a sudden we start saying, I'm pretty good at this. You know, like, this is who I am. You know, you need to buy a house, I'm the realtor, you know, like, that's that's me. I'm, that's my identity. But what God really wants us to say is, like, I'm good at what I'm doing, but it's because of him. It's because of what, what because of the work that God prepared for me to do before I even got here. You might ask the question, you know, like, if, if God's made us this way and, and God's, God's made a work for me to do, why is it so hard to figure out what I, what I should be doing? Like, I know there's been times in my life where I felt like this, this is, what I'm doing is not what I was made to do, you know? Like, ever, anybody ever been there? Like, I, you know, like, this job here is like, it's okay, but, like, this is not me, you know? Like, that, we need to pay attention to that. You know, sometimes you have, I hear people say this with children. I've said it myself. You know, you, you watch a child, like the little girl back there is playing with some cards on the floor. You know, like maybe that's her thing. You know, you have your children that have their special toys or special things they do. And when, when they're doing that, you see, they're in their glory. You know, you have a little, little boy who likes diggers and he's in the sandbox with a bunch of diggers. You know, like he's in his glory, right? And so when you think about your life and the work you do, what is it that makes you feel like you're in your glory? You know? You ever thought about that? It was only, you know, I just turned, I just turned 60 years old just a few months ago. And uh, it's only been, I'd say a few months ago, that I, I really began to discover what it is that, you know, like the work that God made me do. Like what it is that makes me really come alive. And I think as, as followers of Jesus, when we realize what God has saved us from and that he's prepared a work for us to do so we can demonstrate his workmanship, all of a sudden, life kind of has a whole new perspective and a whole new motivation. Instead of making a living, we're trying to be a demonstration of his workmanship. Am I making sense here? All right, you with me? Yeah. We, we got to go. We, we are who God says we are, not what we do with our hands. So what is God saying we are in this passage this morning? You know, we, we, we talked about in the Sunday school. God says in his word there, we have no sin. If we walk with him, we have no sin. So what does that mean? When, when God says you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. If you believe that and you begin to walk in that, it changes your life. One of the one of the phrases, uh, you know, sometimes you hear a phrase and it, it's like out of nowhere, and all of a sudden it just like sticks, you know, for, for no reason at all. I just some time ago, and I don't even know where I came across this or who said it, but I remember this phrase: "There's nothing you can do to make God love you more than He does right now." You believe that? So the opposite is true too. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less than he loves you right now. Nothing. God loves you with unconditional love and grace. And so no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, no matter what history you have or don't have, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less than he does right now. When that actually, when, like my eyes got open to that, to that um, understanding, it, it changed my life. Because now, even though I 
trusted Christ for my salvation, even though I believed that he forgave my sins, I still felt like, <clears throat> like I had to, like, earn it, sort of. You follow me? Maybe some of you never, never experienced that. But it, my, my tendency was always to, you know, like, what I, I want to make God happy, right? I mean, yeah, I'm sure you heard that saying. And we do. We need a. We want to live and please God and follow God, but it's we don't have to do things for God to change us. We just need to walk with Him, and and that's what I like to end with here this morning. It says we were created for good work, and then the last line of the verse says that we should walk in them. I like to I like to think about like when when I when I have a word that I'm trying to understand, I like to think about the opposite of it. So if he's saying that we are created to be a demonstration of his workmanship, and he's given us work to do that he's prepared for us from before we even knew that he loved us, that when we understand all that, walk in it. And it doesn't say uh, crawl in it. It don't say run in it. So he's saying walk in it. Maybe some of you have heard the book. There's a book called the the um, or no how's it the God God walks two miles an hour or God's speed is two miles an hour. That, that's that's considered the average speed of a of a human walk. So. God's pace is usually walking. <coughs> we have no record of Jesus ever running or hurrying anywhere. And there's a podcast that has a tagline for, for church leaders. It says, so, so that the, the purpose of the podcast is so that you can go farther, faster. And when I hear that and I think about walking with God and I think, about the pace of grace and God walking at two miles an hour. That's like, there's not a whole lot of rushing in that. So if I'm crawling, it's kind of like being fearful, right? Going too slow, not trusting God. And if I'm running, I don't know about you, but a lot of my life I've spent like running, thinking I have to go get something done. Like I'm running out of time. I need, you know, God needs to get this done, you know, like I need to hurry up and then Nothing happens, and I say, God, where are you? And then he says, well, just let me catch up. You know what I'm saying? Like, he wants us to walk with him. And I think Jesus, uh, Jesus reminded us that often by the way he treated people and by what he did. He just, he walked from village to village, and he, and he walked with his father. Uh, a couple Sundays ago at our church at Shiloh, our minister, Manny, I don't know if he's been here before. Has Manny been here before? Uh, he made, a, I, I thought it was a profound statement. He said that we do what we do because of what we believe or maybe because of the way we think. Uh, we, we do what we do because of what we believe about ourselves. Sometimes we do what we do because of what we believe about God or what we believe about others. Um, one, of, one of the great leaders of our day, Craig Rochelle, that I, I love listening to, um, he, he has, he said, he says it like this. He says, our lives go in the direction of our strongest thoughts. In other words, what you think the most about, like that's the direction you go. That's the way you walk. Um, just recently, I was at an organization in Reading. They have a, it's called, it's called the R3 uh, program. It's, it's re-entry um, citizens work. Uh, they come out of incarceration, and then this organization with the R3 program helps people uh, <clears throat> get a job and learn some to learn some life skills and learn some job skills. And they were at the graduation, and the one guy came up to uh, several of the graduates, and he said to them, "You know, like when a race car driver is 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 flying down the track, he's not looking at the road right in front of him. He's looking at the curve up ahead that he's going to have to navigate. So he, it's where he's where he's facing." Is the direction he's going. In other words, where you're looking is probably where you're going. Is the way you're headed. I think Jesus said it like this: Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. In other words, that's where your motivation comes from. It's what's important to you. 
He also said that if you love me, I want you to love me with your heart, with your soul, and with your mind. You follow me? So if you love something with your heart, your soul, and your mind, is there anything else that's more important than that thing? Like, which direction are you headed if there's something you love with all your heart, soul, and mind? Like, that's the direction that you're facing, and that's the direction you're going. If we want to walk with God, we must be, we must be uh, loving Jesus with all our heart, soul, and mind. In conclusion, I'd like to challenge you or, or give you an invitation to, um, to be the church when you go to work tomorrow, this week, or whatever you do, go shopping. How many of you um, have ever had, had somebody ask you the question, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how, how sure would you be to go to heaven if you die today? I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that question, but I've, uh, I know of people that, that do that. Now, when you ask somebody that question, there's, there's, there's a time to ask it in the right way, too. You don't want to scare somebody, you know, like you got a gun in your pocket or what you're going to do to me, right? <laughs> um, but how many of you would be willing to take the courage to ask somebody how ready they would be to meet God this week? Would you raise your hand? Anybody, anybody going to have the courage this week to ask somebody? I'm going to get, I'll let you have a couple options here. You can ask that question. Here's another question you can say. If you stood before God and, and uh, you say you're a believer in God, why would God let you into heaven if you stood before him today? That's kind of like a follow-up question. I tried this question with a couple people a few weeks ago. Uh, two people. And both people that I asked this question about one, the one to ten, how sure would you be? God, both of them said, "Oh no, there's no way. I'd, I'd never get there." You know, like I, I, one guy said, "I've just, I don't." He was Muslim, and he said, "I don't follow the, the rules of my religion, so there's no way God's gonna let me in." And another guy said, "No, all the things I've done, like I'll, I'll never make it." You know, so like I didn't have the second question prepared. I didn't know what to say next, so <laughs> we just had a conversation. But. How many of you know that when you go to play baseball and you swing a bat, you don't always hit the ball? At least I don't. You know, like you swing and you miss sometimes. So sometimes when you take your faith to work and you begin to talk to people uh, in conversations you aren't normally used to having, it's not going to go like you might expect. But that doesn't mean that just because you miss the ball doesn't, when you, when you, have, when you play baseball, just because you miss the ball doesn't mean you quit, right? So you got to practice these things. So, um, so when you take your faith to work, you, you get you, you actually ask people questions about their faith, or or when you when you go to uh, Walmart or whatever. I'll make a confession. Um, I challenged my congregation with this uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, it was I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday of the following week. It hit me like you know what? I challenged my congregation to, to you know ask people about their faith, and uh, I never I haven't done that. So I'm in the line over here at Walmart in the customer service line. And I'm, I'm waiting, and I, and I was like two people back, and the lady behind the counter was uh, was obviously uh, pretty pretty far along pregnant, and she must have had some kind of a sinus cold. So and she was up there wheezing, and 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 she was looked very uncomfortable, and um, and I was like, wow, God, this this I need to pray for this lady. You know, like she really looks like she's struggling. And, and uh, what do you want me to say? And, and uh, you know, the person in front of me left, and, and, and she took care of my business, and she never looked at me. She was like, she was miserable. She didn't even want to be there at work, I'm sure. I didn't ask her that question. Maybe I should have. But I, w I went in there, and I talked to her, and, and we did our thing, and, and I left. And I, but I didn't know what to say. I left Walmart feeling really guilty. I said, I'm going to go to my church on Sunday and say, hey, how about some of you ladies go over to the Walmart and pray for the lady at the customer service desk? You know, she needs prayer. <laughs> I didn't feel like it was my place to do that. But I, I think I missed an opportunity. And then um, then a couple days later, I met an old neighbor at the uh, at the Tractor Supply Store. And we talked and we exchanged, you know, like, how you doing? How's the family? Whatever. And I left. And as I was pulling out the driveway, I realized, you know what? Like, 
I never even asked him about his relationship with God because I know he had some real serious struggles when he was my neighbor a few years ago. But like I, I have to, just like everybody else, I have to learn to develop this way of thinking, to transition my mind from just going to church to be in a church where I where I live and where I where I work. And uh, then I, I felt like I, I, I did a little better after I did ask my neighbor or my old neighbor about the story about his life that on my way home I stopped at a, at a neighbor and I've been wanting to talk to him and uh, he was out there in his driveway loading his car with some stuff and then um, in our conversation he said he was uh, about to take his family on a missions trip to, to um, Kentucky or Tennessee or somewhere down south and uh, there again like we had a, we talked about that and what he was going to be doing but I was like why didn't I why didn't I say hey could I pray for you to have a safe trip but I did it's because I wasn't thinking about that. So I said all that to say, how many of you are willing to go to work tomorrow or this week to say, hey, take your faith to work? How many of you are willing to do that? And ask somebody a question. We got a long, we got a couple of, all right, very good. All right, so I'm not gonna be here next Sunday to hold you accountable, but I'll let Lynn do that to see if anybody shared their faith. And maybe next Sunday, you can have a bunch of prayer requests about people you talk to. Another thing I'm really trying to, I'm really trying to do uh, trying to, to learn the discipline of doing this, to ask people if I could pray for them. And all these things are, are done in a in a way where it's appropriate. You know, you don't just like, first thing you ask somebody when you see them at the gas pump or whatever, say, hey, if you died today, you know, like, maybe that's a question you ask, but I, I usually like to get to know somebody first. And so as we, as we um, walk with God in the work that he has planned for us to do, I pray that he'll be glorified, and be, be honored in, the, in, in your life and that you can be a demonstration of his workmanship as you go to work this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful grace that you have you've showered upon us. You've, you've raised us up from the dead. You, you've uh, stood us up and brought us life and then you seated us with Christ. God, we just worship you and honor you and bless you for the privilege we have of being your sons and daughters. For the privilege we have of being being led by you, by your spirit. God, thank you for your word and for the promise that 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 you've given to us this morning, that, that we are your workmanship. We are a demonstration of who you are. God help us to be that demonstration in, a, in an effective way in the in the world that we live in outside this building. As we leave this morning, God, may we bring you honor and glory throughout this week as we as we share your love and your peace and your joy with the world that so desperately is looking for you. God, may you be honored and glorified at EBC here. And as you continue to lead your people here, I pray, God, that you would, you would your blessing would be on this place and on the, on the church that meets here. And God, that you would be honored as we, as, we, uh, as we walk with you and as we bless you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.